Samuel chapter 21. Just open it there and hold it for, for a minute. We're going to look at this passage. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Also, I want to say to you that uh, I have on my own pants this morning. <laughs> some of you will understand that. Some of you, some of you may not. But, but I do. I don't have many. They don't look very good. But these are mine. There's been one occasion where I had somebody else's on when I worshiped with you all at the other church. If you don't know that story, you might be interested, but Wayne needs to know that story. <laughs> You'll share it. Anyway, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for it who you are, that you love us, care about each one of us. Well, I pray this morning that you are thanking you for this time of worship that we've had already, this beautiful music, these who have shared with us, ministered to us in this time this morning already. We praise you and thank you for all the talents and, and gifts that you have given right here in this church to individuals and Thank you, Lord, that they're using them to serve you. I pray now that you bless us and speak to us. Help us that we might be able to hear and understand and know uh, what you have for us today. Help us to, to take a look at why we are here and what, what we need to do from this day forward, perhaps. I pray your blessings on each one in this room. In Jesus' name. Pressed into one little sentence in the 21st chapter of 2 Samuel is the heart of one of the most uh, dramatic and pathetic stories ever written. Tennyson was inspired by it when he wrote his poem, Rizba. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with the story. There was a famine in the days of David that lasted for three years. And David came to the place where he could not help but turn his eyes toward God and say, Why? What's going on? What's the reason for this? And the Lord told him that it was because of Saul's treatment or, or mistreatment of the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were a remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had promised them in the name of Jehovah that they would not be molested, that they would not be mistreated. However, Saul, in his zeal for Israel, maybe even in anger, and walked roughshod over this little group of Gibeonites. And the Lord told David to make amends, make atonement, cover it up, fix it if you can, and the famine will cease. And David quickly dispatched a messenger to the Gibeonites, requesting them to send emissaries that could make, uh, empowered to make peace. And smilingly, these cunning diplomats from the Gibeonites came in, and, and David said to them, I want to make amends to you for what Saul did. You tell me what I can do. And graciously they answered. They said, well, we don't want you to give us any silver. We don't want you to give us any gold. We don't want you to put, put anybody in debt. And David walked head on into their well-laid trap. Then, if you don't want any silver, if you don't want any gold, if you don't want me to put anybody to debt, you just tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you. Their smiles disappeared and, and the teeth of the wolf came out. Their answer must have stunned David because they asked for the seven sons of Saul that they might take them up the hill of Gibeah and torture them. The King James Version uses the word hang. Our old Hebrew professor said it probably meant a crucifier, or hang with nails. They took the seven sons of Saul up the hill of Gibeah Runners went out to summon all the Gibeonites. 
we draw on our imagination for a moment, we can, we can see what happened. All day long they paraded back and forth in front of these, these seven suffering sons of Saul and they snapped their fingers and they, they hissed and they ridiculed and, and they jeered and they sneered. Finally, the day ended and the boys were dead. Twilight descended. As it did, the old, an old woman, mother of two of these sons, a concubine of Saul, slowly climbed the hill to give him. Sobs shook her frail frame, and tears ran down her face and dropped onto the ground. And when she found the two that belonged to her, I imagine that she did what any American mother would have done, what, what any mother in this room would have done. She grabbed their, their legs and, and she kissed their bloody feet and, and she wept her heart out there as she stood close to those that she loved. It was the law in that time that anybody who was to put to death couldn't be buried. So they had to hang there until the wind rattled their bones, as, as Tennyson said. Oh, and the vultures came and picked them clean or until the beasts of the forest came and, and tore them down and took them away. That was, to, that was their fate or what it was supposed to be. Night came and Rizpah spread her sackcloth on a rock to rest. But there was no rest because the wild beasts of the forest smelled the blood of these who were hanging there and snarlingly they came for their feast. What'd she do? Scream in terror and run away? Oh no. Oh no. The Bible says she took her sackcloth and she flashed it over her head and she screamed in defiance and she drove them back into the forest. All night long, time after time after time, she did this. Finally, the night ended. The day came. Exhausted, again she spread her sackcloth to rest. But there was no rest because all of a sudden there was a shadow. And then another shadow, and then another shadow, and wearily, wearily, she looked, raised her head, raised her face to see the vultures of the air that had come for their feast. Once more, the sackcloth flashed into fights, and she screamed at them and drove them away. Now, if you have your Bible open, to chapter 21, 2 Samuel, look at beginning at verse 10. And let's see what it says. And Rizka, the daughter of Leah, took sackcloth and spread it far upon the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air by day nor the beasts of the field by night to rest on them. My friend, the barley harvest was in May. The rain, the first rains came in September. May, June, July, August, September. For almost five months, she stayed there among the decaying bodies of those seven sons, and she drove the beasts of the fields off by night and the birds of the air by day. And then into the silken seclusion of David's, David's palace seeped the rumor, poor Rizba. Oh, poor Rizba, she's, she's losing her mind, she's going mad. And David said, what's wrong with Rizpah? They said, oh, haven't you heard? They fixed a little tent for her up there on the hill of Gibeah uh, where the seven sons of Saul are, and she's kept the beasts off at night and the birds of the air by day. She's been faithful. She hasn't left her post. They've been carrying her something to eat. And David, remorseful, his heart just bursting, issued an order. He said, take that law off the statute books and take it off now. Go get those seven sons of Saul, bring them down here, and bury them in the king's burying ground, because that's where they belong. That's where they'll be. Now that's the story. But I want to ask a question. One question. Are that three group, three, those three groups of people who were there on the hill of Gibeah on that faithful day. And as we ask that question and answer it, this, this story comes down right down to where you and I are today. And the question is this. Why are you here on the hill of Gideon? Why are you here today? Ask it first of those seven 
sons of Saul. And if their swollen lips parched and, and scorched and cracked and their swollen tongues could answer, they would say, our father sinned. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't do anything. Why, why we were just children. We're, we're here because our father sinned. The words of the Old Testament come back to us. The iniquities of the father shall be visited upon the children from generation to generation. Carrie Barker, who was one time captain of Washington and Lee football team, told one of the most pathetic things that he'd ever seen. He said, just before dark one afternoon, walking down the street in Richmond, and saw this little boy sitting on the edge of the sidewalk with his feet hanging down in the street. His elbows were resting on his knees and his face was in his hands. Under his arm was a partially deflated football. He was so pathetic looking, he said, I just, I just couldn't pass by and leave him there. So I sat down by him. And I said, son, what's wrong with you? Why are you sitting here looking like you've, like you've lost your best friend? And he said he twisted around and, and he looked up at me for a minute. He said, mister, did you ever play football? Sure did. I was captain of my team. Fullback for two years. Then, mister, you know what it means for, for a player to be offside. The whole team, not just that one player, the whole team gets penalized. Everybody that's in the grandstands pulling for that team gets penalized. Everybody that's listening on the radio or watching by television gets penalized. Kerry Barker said, you're exactly right, son. Everybody gets penalized. And after a moment or two, he said, well, mister, my daddy, my daddy's offside because he came home to my drunk. My mother had the nicest dinner ready. Happy, singing, smiling as she put it on the table. He said, I was in the bathroom washing my face and hands when he came in. He came in and slammed the door. Came over to where my mother was and pushed her around. Slapped her across the face. And he said, I sneaked out the back door because I came over here because I couldn't stand to see what I was seeing. Thought I'd kick the football around for a while, but mister, it's no fun to kick a football around by yourself. All the other boys have gone home. Kerry Barker said, I stayed with him a long time. Took him out, got him something to eat. And then eventually went on my way thinking how the sins of a father or the sins of a mother can wreck the happiness of a home and the happiness of a boy. It's just a step to the story of the two prodigal sons. The one of them spending his money and riotous living and and breaking his father's heart and the other one guilty of the sins of disposition and refusing to come into the feast and, and likewise breaking a father's heart. My friend, it's just as this little, this little boy said, when, when one person is offside, the whole team, the whole church, the whole family gets penalized. Why are you here on the hill today? Let's ask the question again. This time we ask it of that little group of Gibeonites. Why are you here on the hill? And back comes the answer through gritted teeth. Revenge. Revenge. We're here to get even. We're here to settle a grudge. We're here to get even with the man that we hated. And here, my friend, there's another deadly <coughs> sin that in this generation needs to be brought into the open where, where the light of reason and the words of Jesus can enable us to see its danger. Because you see, a little grudge, a little grievance, nursed and pondered and brooded over can become a cancer in our souls that is far more deadly than any physical cancer that you and I could ever possibly have. We let our imaginations play around it. We go to sleep at night thinking about it until it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually wrecks our health and spoils our peace of mind. There are literally thousands and thousands of people today whose physical health is entirely undermined and wrecked because of grievances and grudges that they carry around in their heart seeking revenge. Let me say this to us. If there's anybody in this room today who's been hurt, 
by anybody else, a family member, somebody at school, somebody at work, by some experience in your life, if you and I have been hurt by something, the only way we can ever really know healing for that hurt is as we are willing to totally forgive whoever and whatever hurts. Why are you here? Why are you here? I'm a new today. But let's ask the question once more. This time we ask it of that, that little woman who's there, Rizpa. Rizpa? Why, why are you here today? And the answer comes back in an old familiar refrain. Because a mother loves. You see, it's a picture that stirs the human heart. A little mother sitting there among the crosses on the hill of Gibeah because, because two of her boys had been crucified there. Just a few miles away. And just a few days away, if we measure by God's great clocks, another son was hanged by nails on Galilee. There on Calvary, at sunset, three other crosses were silhouetted against the sky. And if we ask the one in the center, why are you here? Why are you here? Back comes the answer, because because a father loves. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But the answer would not be complete even here. And I think the master would continue. Thus the fathers and the children of the world have sinned. That's the reason also I'm here. Resentments and revenge also drove the nails into my hands. The story of Rizpah, you see, and the story of Jesus have many things in common. And they bring to mind this morning the most beautiful illustration of the atonement that perhaps I've ever heard. Dr. J.C. Massey, a popular evangelist in the state of Georgia many years ago now, closed a sermon one time about like this. He said, my mother was the sweetest woman in the world. But she was very strict about one thing. <clears throat> he said she, she wouldn't let us boys play on her snow white feather beds. Now, some of you don't even know what feather beds are. Some of you young river snappers. But, but some of us know about snow white feather beds. She prided herself in having the prettiest, the loveliest snow white feather beds in the state of Georgia. And he said, oh, how I wanted to get in that bedroom and get up on the end of one of those beds and just jump as high as I could jump and flatten out and just sink out of sight in the middle of one of them. And he said, I knew it would be heavenly, but, but my mother firmly refused. One day it had been raining. My big brother had ridden his horse out on the farm and checked the drainage ditches. And he said, my mother and I were in the woodshed. She was washing clothes, and I was making mud pies. And he said, after a while, I got tired of making blood pies. And I went in the house. And I started down the hall. And he said, as I passed by those bedrooms, it seemed as though those big snow white feather beds just reached out and, and beckoned me to come in. And he said, before I knew it, I stood on the end of one of them. And I jumped just as high as I could jump, and I flattened out, and, and I just sunk out of sight right in the middle of one of them. He said, I was having the time of my life for a few minutes. And then he said, I heard the rustle of skirts. <clears throat> and I looked, and my mother was standing there in the door, and her hand was ominously behind her. And he said, I knew what was about that. But he said, I knew that I deserved the whipping that I was about to get. But he said, just then, the window on the other side of the room went up, and that big six-foot brother of mine came crawling in that window. And he said, wait just a minute, mother. Just a minute. He said, I could see his horse standing outside. He had ridden by and saw what was going on, and he came in. Came over the bed where I was, and he said, he just draped that big six-foot frame of his right down on top of me on that bed. And he said, all right, mother. 
Lay it on. Lay it on him good. But this time, I'll take it for him. And he said, I listened. But the switch didn't fall. He said, when I peeped out from under my mother's shoulder, I saw on her face the strangest expression. He said, oh, it was beautiful. There was a trace of a tear. Her lips quivered a little bit, and her, her eyes glistened. And she was smiling, and she looked at him. She said to him like she had forgotten that I was there. She said, okay, you great big lovable rascal. Pick him up. Get him out of here. But don't come this way. If you do, I'll whip up. up. <laughs> and he said he carried me over to the window, and he put me on the horse in front of him, and we rode up. Dr. Massey said the years rolled on. And he said, one day, one day I was where my heavenly father told me not to go. And he said, I bowed my head for the fall of the rod, which I knew, which I knew I deserved. But he, he said, then I felt an arm go around my shoulder. And I heard that quiet, gentle voice of Jesus say, I'll take it for him. I'll take it for me. He said, I opened my eyes, and it seemed as though I could see three crosses silhouetted against an evening sky. And from somewhere I could hear a voice saying, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's a fountain filled with Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that blood, lose all their guilty sin. Why are you here? Why are you here?